Hi everyone, Jolene here from Bookworm Adventure Girl. Welcome back. I hope that you are having a good day. And for those of you who have a long weekend like we do, I hope that you are enjoying this holiday Monday. The weather is beautiful here. Um, in today's Mondays with Margaret episode, we will be talking about the poetry collection called Morning in the Burned House. Morning in the Burned House was originally published in 1995. The collection is dedicated to Atwood's family, which I think is appropriate for this collection just in terms of its themes. Um, it is divided into five parts. Part one has seven poems, which kind of set the tone for the entire collection. And in the poems, we meet um, characters of different ages or remembering themselves uh, and their lives at younger ages. In part two, the poems seem to be about sexuality and women, uh, especially women's relationships with men and how they relate to men and how men relate to them. And nature is also used in metaphors to well, describe many things, but to specifically describe women. Um, one of the poems is about Manet's painting of Olympia. There's also one about Ava Gardner. And I think I'm going to read a little bit of the one about Helen of Troy. Um, this poem is called um, Helen of Troy Does Table Dancing. It's a longer poem, so I'm only going to read like the first little bit. And it begins on page 33. Helen of Troy Does Counter Dancing. The world is full of women who tell me I should be ashamed of myself if they have the chance. Quit dancing. Get some self-respect and a day job. Right, and minimum wage, and varicose veins just standing in one place for eight hours behind a glass counter, bundled up to the neck, instead of naked as a meat sandwich. Selling gloves or something, instead of what I do sell. You have to have talent to peddle a thing so nebulous and without material form. Exploited, they'd say. Yes, any way you cut it, but I have a choice of how, and I'll take the money. I do give value. Like preachers, I sell vision. Like perfume ads, desire, or it's facsimile. Like jokes or war, it's all in the timing. I sell men back their worst suspicions that everything's for sale and piecemeal. They gaze at me and see a chainsaw murder just before it happens, when thigh, ass, ink blot, crevice, tit, and nipple are still connected. Such hatred leaps in them my beery worshippers, that or a bleary, hopeless love, seeing the rows of heads and upturned eyes, imploring but ready to snap at my ankles. I understood flood and earthquakes and the urge to step on ants. I keep the beat and dance for them because they can't. The music smells like foxes, crisp as heated metal, searing the nostrils or humid as August, hazy and lang languorous as a looted city the day after when all the rape's been done already, and the killing, and the survivors wander around looking for garbage to eat, and there's only a bleak exhaustion. So I will stop there, it does continue. Part three also has the theme of nature, especially in the poem Frogless. Um, and there are also themes of the role of women and war in this section. And there are two poems that I'd like to talk about and share a bit with you. Um, the first is The Loneliness of the Military Historian. And I think I will read a little bit from page 49 onto 50, and then maybe a little bit more on page 52, there's a part that um, I, I thought was brilliant. In general, I might agree with you. Women should not contemplate war, should not weigh tactics impartially, or evade the word enemy or view both sides and denounce nothing. Women should march for peace or hand out white feathers to arouse bravery, spit themselves on bayonets to protect their babies whose skulls will be split anyway, or having been raped repeatedly, hang themselves with their own hair. These are the functions that inspire general comfort, that and the knitting of socks for the troops and a sort of moral cheerleading, also mourning the dead, sons, lovers, and so forth all the killed children. And then on page 52, there's a, there's a little bit of a verse here that I liked. 
Sometimes men throw themselves on grenades and burst like pink brew bags of guts to save their comrades. I can admire that, but rats and cholera have won many wars. Those and potatoes were the absence of them. It's no use pinning all those medals across the chests of the dead. Impressive, but I know too much. Grand exploits merely depress me. The other poem that I wanted to mention is Half Hanged Mary. You may remember that I mentioned Mary Webster um, when we talked about, I think it was Second Words, The Handmaid's Tale was dedicated to her as well. And Atwood believes that she is a descendant or an ancestor, um, that Mary Webster is an ancestor, um, who was hanged for being a witch. Uh, but when they came to get her body, she was still alive. And of course, they couldn't hang her twice for the same crime. And she lived for 14 more years. Um, the poem Half Hanged Mary is divided into sections of every hour or hour or two of her hanging and what she is experiencing. And then Atwood follows Half Hanged Mary with um, Owl Burning, which um, ends this section. And this poem is... Um, it has an animals in that country kind of vibe. Um, and then part four begins with the poem Man in a Glacier. And I thought that this could be a throwback to Atwood's short story called Next uh, is the Age of Lead from I think it was Wilderness Tips. And the, the story was about John Torrington whose body was exhumed from ice from the Franklin Expedition in 1845. And this section, which has 12 poems, uh, seems to be about Margaret Atwood's father. He died in January of 1993, which is only a couple years before this collection was published. And I'm not sure how he died, but my guess is that he may have had some type of dementia um, because the poems are about uh, life and what we remember or don't remember and memories that we have and the parts of other people's stories that we don't uh, know. And death is also a theme in this section. And I think I will share uh, one poem from this section with you. I really liked the poem Dancing, and this is on page 90. It was my father taught my mother how to dance. I never knew that. I thought it was the other way. Ballroom was their style. A graceful twirling, curved arms and fancy footwork, a green-eyed radio. There is always more than you know. There are always boxes put away in the cellar, worn shoes and cherished pictures, notes you find later, sheet music you can't play. A woman came on Wednesdays with tapes of waltzes. She tried to make him shuffle around the floor with her. She said it would be good for him. He didn't want to. Part five is the last section and the theme uh, is about home and what belongs to us and what doesn't belong to us. And the section ends with the title poem, Morning in the Bird House, um, which I think uh, brings the collection together quite nicely um, as the person in the poem is reflecting back on the life that they had with their family and mourning that it no longer exists the way that it, that it once did. So I'm going to finish by reading that poem to you, and it begins on page 126. In the burned house I am eating breakfast. You understand there is no house, there is no breakfast, yet here I am. The spoon which was melted scrapes against the bowl which was melted also. No one else is around. Where have they gone to? Brother and sister, mother and father? Off along the shore, perhaps? Their clothes are still on the hangers, their dishes piled beside the sink, which is beside the wood stove with its grate and sooty kettle, every detail clear, tin cup and rippled mirror. The day is bright and songless. The lake is blue, the forest watchful. In the east, a bank of cloud rises up silently like dark bread. I can see the swirls in the oilcloth. I can see the flaws in the glass, those flares where the sun hits them. I can't see my own arms and legs, or know if this is a trap or blessing, finding myself back here, where everything in this house has long been over, kettle and mirror, spoon and bowl, including my own body, including the body I had then, including the body I have now as I sit at this morning table, alone and happy. 
bare child's feet on the scorched floorboards, I can almost see in my burning clothes the thin green shorts and grubby yellow t-shirt holding my cindery non-existent radiant flesh incandescent. Let me know if you've read Morning in the Burned House and if you had any favorite or maybe least favorite poems from it. I'd be happy to hear your thoughts on any of them. Um, I look forward to chatting with you in the comments. Thanks again for watching. I hope you enjoy your day and don't forget to make every day an adventure. Mm -hmm.